Welcome to the planning board of the town of Deerfield on Monday, May 9th, 2022. And um, Kathy, will you read our introduction, please? Kathy, the truck. Sure, right here. The meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion <laughs> with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation in accordance with the, go with the Governor Baker's June 16th, 2020 one act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, including an extension of the remote participation provisions of his March 20, 2020 executive order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GLC 30A20. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt in the progress. virtual broadcast <laughs> unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. For purposes of this in-person attendance, the town of Deerfield will host the meeting in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Offices with remote participation details noted below. And there's a link to join the Zoom meeting. That's on the town. <coughs> Thank website. you, Kathy. That's on the town website. <coughs> right. <coughs> and <coughs> a reminder to all that our meeting guidelines are to speak one at a time, follow our Deerfield Code of Conduct, to be respectful, considerate, courteous, <clears throat> and also we want to be concise, non-repetitive, and recognized by the chair. <clears throat> so, board members in attendance: Rachel Blaine here. Rachel Blaine. Uh, Kathy Wetrova. Kathy Wetrova here. Andrea Liebson. Andrea Liebson here. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester here. Uh, Denise Mason. Denise Mason here. Uh, <clears throat> and Mary Cloutier, I think, is on her way. So we'll see when she's in attendance. And Emily Wolf call here. Thank you. <clears throat> um, minutes of April 4th. Rachel, do you want to tell us what's happening? Uh, I thought I sent them. I haven't. Sorry. They're ready. I just haven't sent them out. I really thought I sent them last week. So sorry. Minutes have a way of doing Minutes that. are coming. All right. <clears throat> if you want to watch the meeting, uh, it's on YouTube. <laughs> sorry. It was an important meeting to us, so I apologize. And under new business now, um, public hearing, Anne Mary, could you, oopsie, well, no, Anne Mary, the introduction um, here. Let's see. Um, Denise, could you read the introduction? Sure. Notice is hereby given that the Deerfield Planning Board will hold public hearing on May 9th. Denise, can you speak into the mic a little bit? It's not working. Yours is it's not as good as mine. Got the wrong one. How's this one? Oh, 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 oh. Hot mic. That's okay. better. Notice is hereby given that the Deerfield Planning Board will hold a public hearing on May 9th, 2022 at 7 p.m. on the application from Joshua Catherine LeMay for a special permit for a proposed project to construct a single family house with a drive with a driveway that exceeds 500 feet in length located on Stockbridge Road. Assessor's Map 161, Lot 12.1. Meetings are being held in hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation. For purposes of in-person attendance, the Town of Deerfield will host the meeting in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Offices at 8 Conway Street, South Deerfield, Mass. 01373, remote participation noted below. Thank you. Um, and um, we will begin, actually, as a little bit of a uh, <laughs> intro, um, I have been looking into a little bit more about the regulations as to what we should be saying and doing as we have public hearings. So you'll notice a few more pieces of bureaucracy tonight, <laughs> but hopefully it means that things are clear and transparent. Um, I will begin by... Um, Noting that our public hearing tonight is the application, as Denise mentioned in the public hearing notice of Joshua and Catherine LeMay for a special permit on the proposed driveway that exceeds 500 feet in length located on Stockbridge Road, map 161, lot 121. The statute that governs our deliberations and decision this evening is section 3400. Um, in particular, the uh, issues that we 
as the planning board especially are concerned with is that there is reasonable and safe access from the public way to within 100 feet of the building site for vehicles, including but not limited to fire, emergency, and police. And also that there's proper frontage and grade not to exceed 8% in certain areas. Um, the, oh, and Mary, welcome. And Mary present. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the process to be followed tonight is um, we will have a presentation by the applicant. Um, then we will have a discussion presentation of the written or verbal comments by um, town boards or, or departments, um, an opportunity for public comments. We will close or continue the public hearing, um, but when it is closed, we'll have our deliberations and vote on the application with possible conditions. So as we begin too, um, I did check with our um, building assistant, Sue Brewat, um, about our notices. And it is important for us to know that um, the proper notices were sent and posted um, to abutters on April 21st, also abutting towns and boards and departments on April 25th. Um, <clears throat> the notices were also published in the Greenfield Recor Recorder on April 25th and May 5th, and posted in the town hall foyer on April 20th. And all notices did include the date, time, place, and hearing, the names of the applicants, um, a brief description of the request to be heard, um, including reference to the applicable statute and the address and map and lot. So we are all clean with that. Um, onward. So our public um, hearing, um, I'm not sure if applicants, um, if you have any overview or um, statements you'd like to make at the beginning, are you our applicants? <laughs> I assume, thank you, please come. And if you can identify yourselves and your address, AT Stockbridge, <laughs> we think. <clears throat> thank you. So I'm Josh Lemay, uh, one of the applicants. For the I'm Catherine. Nice to meet you, thank you. <clears throat> so we don't really have a presentation, but uh, we filed it. It's a uh, single family residence on Stockbridge Road. And those driveways a little under 800 feet through an open field like used for agriculture currently. So there are no access issues. Thank you. I think that's more than adequate. Okay. <laughs> we did receive your application, which was thorough and um, appreciate, appreciate that. Um, in regards to um, uh, comments from our boards and town departments, um, the Board of Health and the Fire Department had no concerns um, the highway and police had no comments, but as we on the board know that that means that it's inferred that there are no concerns. Um, the Conservation Commission did not send us a specific comment um, in, in regards to this. However, they did have a notice of intent. They did determine that there were wetlands on the property, but they, uh, but they approved the notice of intent with conditions about that, those wetlands. Um, the select board also had no concerns. Um, they did need to address the issue that the property was under 61A, meaning that uh, it's agricultural, horticultural land use with special tax provisions. And when this occurs, the town has, um, or if, if, if there's going to be a transfer or set sale of the property to a relative, the town has the right of first refusal to purchase the property. Um, the select board has voted to waive their right to purchase the land, um, freeing it for the sale to the family member. Um, building commissioner um, has stated that the driveway will satisfy the requirements of section 3430 and will provide safe and reasonable access for fire police and emergency vehicles and has no, no concerns. Um, Mr. Walden, you're on, I see. Do you, do you have any other um, comments in relation to that? Um, no, I do not. I mean, we, the fire department and I walked the driveway and we were all satisfied with the access. So I really have no other comments or concerns. Thank you, thank you. This is the uh, the message of doing your homework before yeah. <laughs> the meeting. Um, planning board, do you have any questions of any of the, um, I guess it would primarily be of the 
building inspector, none of the other representatives are here this evening. Yeah, I just have, I have a question, Mrs. Jones. So you got the hot mic. Oh, just on the hot mic. So you said that um, the select board waived that. So is that in writing? Well, it should be in there, at least in their minutes. And I imagine okay. it would be in something else, Jen. Yeah, so they um, they voted it. And so I believe we will have it in the, well, we'll definitely have it in the minutes. Okay, good. But yeah, and we did have a, we did have a letter um, from the applicant to... Um, the select board asking for that request. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Yep. Definitely want that in the future. Thank you, Jen. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if we have any other expert testimony coming before us this evening. Let's see. Okay. Um, so, uh, or any public comments <clears throat> now? From any members of the public? Or... There's no comment online. Okay, thank you. I have a question. So what is the closest public way? Stockbridge Road is a public that, way. That's yeah. it. That's yep. the road. Okay. And what's it would go right on. What's near? It's Mill. What's at Mill? It's off of South Mill River. Road. South okay. 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 I had to orient myself too. Okay. I guess that was so potentially if there's no more discussion, could we have a motion to close the public hearing? I make a motion to close the public hearing. Thank you. That was Kathy Sylvester. Second? I second that, Denise Mason. Thank you, is there any discussion? No, okay, so um, we'll call a vote to close the public hearing. Rachel Blaine? Uh, I, <clears throat> yes, Rachel Blaine. <laughs> Kathy Wittroba? Kathy Wittroba, yes. Andrea Leibson? Andrea Leibson, yes. Kathy Sylvester? Kathy Sylvester, yes. Denise Mason? Denise Mason, yes. And Anne Mary Cloutier? Anne Mary Cloutier, yes. And Anne Lee Wolfkrieg, yes. So the public hearing is closed. So now for our deliberations, um, we will have deliberations, including discussion of possible conditions. Can I ask a quick question? Sorry, can I ask one quick question? Super out of order. What's the paving? What are you gonna? It's a uh, gravel. It is just a gravel road. I, I knew that. Thank you. I did. It's hard to think and yes, right, <laughs> right at the same time. <clears throat> True gum. Um, it's yeah. in fact not our role to refute any yes. information presented at the public hearing or to yeah. provide additional information yes. um, for or against the application. That is the applicant's or opposition's responsibility, not ours. Um, and we need to base our decision on the findings and the applicable laws I mentioned earlier. And um, obviously, as I said earlier, we can consider conditions. So. Um, uh, if we can have our deliberation now. May, may I ask a question about what the um, Conservation Commission thought? Conservation Commission was the one that did de determine their wetlands and they improved the notice of intent with conditions about the wetlands. And so they're clear with the project going forward. Okay. So they, they, they approve the project, but uh, want to make sure that the wetlands are maintained. Are protected. Are protected. Correct. I have a question too. So, yes, Kathy. So dated May 3rd from the fire department, it says the fire department has no further comment. What does that mean? Like no further comment? Are they saying it's fine or is no further comment mean they're waiting on something? No. No, no I think it's fine. that they're, they're fine. fine. And also as Mr. Walden mentioned, he did discuss this with yeah. them. And yeah. um, they're fine with, um, again, our, our primary concern with uh, fire department is that there's um, good access for emergency vehicles. Fire suppression. Are there other um, questions in terms of um, deliberation or con conditions? One of the conditions that um, we usually have as a standard condition and that I would like us to entertain is that um, any variation from the plans as submitted be approved um, by the planning board prior to any commencement of work. Um, does that seem reasonable to you? I think that sounds right. And you're okay with that? Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, um, as we then entertain a motion, we need to, uh, it, it seems as if, I mean, our general findings in relation to this is, um, according to testimony and documents that there are no objections 
um, from abutters. Nothing has been said from any of them. No objections from town boards or staff. Um, our applicable law section 3400 um, does seem to, seems that um, we have found evidence that there is reasonable and safe access for the vehicles. Apparently there's okay front frontage and grading. We heard no comments or concerns about that. So, um, and then our, our possible condition of um, uh, that any variation from the plans need to come back to us before there's any work commenced. So could um, we have a motion to- So I move that we request that we approve, uh, I request approval for the special permit for construction of a single family house with a driveway that exceeds 500 feet in length, located on Stockbridge Road, Assessor's Maps 161 Lot 12.1, pursuant to our 179 in Section 340 of the Deerfield Zoning Bylaw, with the following condition. Any variation from the plans as submitted must be approved by the Planning Board prior to commencement of work. Thank you. And, and that was seconded by whom? That was Kathy. Yes, that's you. Kathy that's what, that was what saying. Um, is there any discussion? Further discussion? No. All right, a quorum or a, a, a quorum in voting for us tonight. The um, majority vote of the people present is um, huh. it, with the, the motion would go in whatever direction of the majority vote. So. Um, then I will call the question. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. Kathy Wetroba. Kathy Wetroba, yes. Andrea Leibson. Andrea Leibson, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. And Mary Cloutier. Mary Cloutier, yes. And Emily Wolfcore, yes. So we passed the special permit. <laughs> Congratulations. What an exciting Thank you. project. Congratulations on your wonderful driveway. You may come back and curse us wow. when you. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking. We'll be gone. We yes. meet on Friday nights. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, All right. <laughs> Um, next on our agenda, um, we have Chris Curtis discussing some healthy soils zoning initiatives. Um, Mr. Curtis, you don't sit down, you come back up. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll, as he's taking a seat, um, we have started on the planning board conversations about looking at zoning in our town center. In particular, we've talked about being more walkable, more green, and have more fi mixed use, among other things. Um, the Green Infrastructure Committee and the MVP work group um, have some interesting ideas, and Chris is going to present those tonight, and that is in relation to, um, to some of the conversations that we're starting on um, town center. Chris? Thank you. Um, I think most of you know me, but just for anybody that might be watching, I'm uh, the town's MVP consultant, and the town has been working on municipal vulnerability preparedness now for five years. And the current grant that we have has a component in it uh, for healthy soils. And we're looking um, with, in, in concert, working with regenerative design and Keith Salzberg in particular, at the soils in town and what the um, importance of those soils are for carbon sequestration. And that's a really important component of, of climate change and, and uh, protecting us from um, climate change. So you may recall that Keith and I came before you once before, uh, a few months back. Um, Keith did a presentation on some of his findings at that point. And um, he's done some additional work now um, and really identified which soils in town and mapped them um, are the most important for carbon sequestration, which ones are the, the healthiest soils. And if you look at the handout, which I'll be referring to uh, uh, during my discussion here, on the last two pages, there's a couple of maps that oh. Keith produced. Um, probably the most important one is the soil conservation regeneration value that sort of blue and green one. And um, that one shows where those most important soils are. And as you can kind of see from the map, um, the, the really high conservation value 
focuses most heavily on the forested upland areas of, of Deerfield, which frankly was a little bit of a surprise to me. I mm. wasn't expecting that, um, but that's what, what their findings were. Um, and then second most important, um, well, actually the most important, which are, are a little harder to see on the map, um, were wetland soils. Um, so those are, those are the number one forest uplands are second. Agricultural soils were third and then turf soils were the, were the fourth. And agricultural soils show up primarily um, in sort of brownish color. They have a high soil regeneration value, which from my understanding means that they have a lot of potential for carbon sequestration, but better management practices are needed in order to maximize that. So things like no-till agriculture. So my job is to work with um, what kinds of strategies would help the town to preserve and protect the, the best and most healthy soils in town. And what kinds of strategies are really doable or applicable in a community like Deerfield. And we've come up with um, a pretty long list of those strategies which are in the table um, on the first and second pages. And I'm not gonna go through all of those, but um, you might notice that there are some that apply um, to the planning board as the lead entity, others are more for community preservation committee, open space committee, or conservation commission. So lots of potential um, involvement of different boards in town. The four that I, the four strategies that I think we want to focus on the most from the perspective of this, of this study um, are the ones that I'd like to talk to you about tonight and kind of briefly summarize them and maybe have a little bit of a dialogue with the planning board about these and how applicable and appropriate you think they might be um, in town. So those four uh, strategies which are again in the, summarized in the handout are transfer of development rights post-construction soil performance standards, upland forest protection overlay zoning. And then the fourth one is um, expanded wetland or water resource buffers. That's probably more of a conservation commission issue. Uh, so I'm gonna focus, I think, on most heavily on the first three. So starting with transfer of development rights. Um, this is a technique that has been used pretty successfully in communities to protect farmland um, in particular um, through a mechanism that um, uses the private development, um, private development um, resources to protect um, farmland and, and purchase development rights. So you may be familiar with the Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program, which is a publicly funded way to, to purchase development rights. This is similar to that, except that the development rights are actually bought by a private developer or individual um, person that wants to do development and they get protected in the same way. Um, example of this would be um, in the town of Hadley. Um, they have a transfer of development rights bylaw and um, it's been pretty successfully used over the past I think it's been 15 years. I actually wrote it, so I should probably know. Um, <laughs> but um, it's been set up so that um, development rights can be purchased in the prime agricultural sections of the community, which are mostly in the north portion and, and south portion of town. And the, the area where they are used is along the um, Route 9 corridor and the town center. So uh, developers have, have done that. I think it's been used at least 15 times to my knowledge. Um, and there's been substantial acreage of farmland protected without any investment of um, town funds. So that's kind of the advantage to this. And the way it's set up is that um, a, a community would set up a sending zone and a receiving zone. And again, as using the Hadley example, the sending zone is the, that farmland area receiving zone being the village center and um, the highway corridor. That could be in Deerfield, it could be the existing village centers and your existing um, commercial and industrial um, districts. And the sending zone in, in Deerfield um, 
could be those areas that we've again sort of targeted on the, on the map that I was talking about earlier, the forest upland areas and some of the agricultural areas in town. Um, in the receiving zone, we would need to think about what are the incentives that the town could actually offer to make this happen. There has to be some kind of an incentive. So it's either, you know, improving the ability to um, develop ex an existing property by increasing the allowable density or the lot coverage or building heights, um, could be reducing parking requirements or some of the setback or other dimensional standards or it could be um, allowing um, actually a new use, which in Deerfield, I think one of the ideas that I've been thinking a lot about is, is um, some kind of a mixed use zoning, um, particularly appropriate for the town center, I think, where you could have a mix of commercial <coughs> and residential uses in the same structure or complex um, and a variety of retail types of uses there's a way to make that um, really work with TDR so that someone applying for mixed use would get that as an incentive in return for protecting some, some land elsewhere in town. So I, I think this is one of the more exciting ideas. And the reason that I like it is that it doesn't create any new development restrictions. So there's no one that really would presumably be opposed to it because it's not impacting anyone in a negative way. It's really providing an opportunity both for protecting land um, to the benefit of the property owner because they would receive payment for development rights. And it would provide an opportunity for um, those folks that are interested in, in development in, in these receiving areas to get some benefits as well. It doesn't force anybody to do anything. It's you know it's purely optional. It's it's a it's something that anyone could decide to partake of or not. Um, so and it was interesting in Hadley, you know again just to take that example, Hadley is probably one of the toughest communities I've ever worked with in terms of getting zoning bylaws passed. Um, so there's, there's a lot of contention in in the community, and we actually had. Um, at town meeting, we had both the farmers and the major property owners of commercial development stand up and say that they wanted this bylaw to go forward. And I think it was maybe the only time in Hadley's history that there was sort of agreement about something like that. Um, so in interesting concept, um, and it would really require, you know, working with the board to think about, again, what are the incentives that could be offered and what what do we feel comfortable with in terms of you know, maybe increased density, lot sizes, dimensional requirements, et cetera. Um, so maybe I'll just stop there for a second and see if you are, you know, have questions or if this is making sense to you. Um, so, go ahead. Yeah, I do have a question, Denise. Um, so you said that a private company can do this. What happens if they decide to sell those rights continue on with the purchase? The development rights um, under this scenario would transfer to the town. Mm -hmm. And that, so they would be permanently held and protected um, similar to an APR or a conservation restriction. So there wouldn't be any option for the development company to sell the, the rights to someone else if that's okay. what you're asking. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, and Mary. <clears throat> A few years ago, maybe, Rachel, maybe you can help me. Max had brought up a question. I wish I could hear his voice in my head right now. Yeah. Because he said that one of the potential outcomes that he could see would to be inadvertently driving up um, the price of farmland. farmland. Yeah. And I, at the time, asked questions, but I don't remember. <laughs> so... I just want to be trying to think about our farmers too. So I was hoping that that would ring some bells or if anyone could help me brainstorm how that might be a possibility because I do remember him saying that, but I don't remember the details, but I don't want to overlook anyone in our community. Right, the conundrum being that mm, 
by get, offering these kind of values to the development rights, then for farmers to buy more farmland. So it protects the farmers that have farmland, but it's not as advantageous for the growing farmer or the younger farmer who's gathering more land per se. I mean, I think that's part of the, that's part of the concern that potentially Max was talking about. I remember her coming. I mean, we've just, in Deerfield, we've just approved a APR financing for Ostrowski Farm. So it's not, you know, we're, we're familiar with that kind of idea of buying out the rights. Um, and I, I think for me, I, I, I really need to hear, you work so hard on a use table and you, you know, you look at, we're, we're going to look at ups, maybe changing, you know, one of the mandates that we had was to really consider center village frontage, for example. Um, so that would be for everybody. That's across the board. But um, what kinds of flexibility would we be able to offer? What what is what have these other towns done that has offered a uh, developer the incentive to mm -hmm. to make this investment? Yeah. Well, um, again, I think maybe using Hadley as an example, um, I think there's four or so different districts that are in their receiving zone. And that's the area where the incentives come into play. So in a couple of them, for example, um, the minimum lot size can be reduced from, there's one where you can reduce it from 15,000 square feet to 12,000 square feet, set back uh, the frontage from 120 feet down to 100 feet. Some of the setbacks from 15 to 10. Um, building coverage goes from 25% up to 35%. Uh -huh. Uh, maximum height goes from 35 feet to 40 feet. So those are some examples. I, you know, there's four different districts and the numbers are different for each one of them. Um, but there's, you know, the potential for using those. Um, Can I ask you a question uh, mechanically? So you've got these different zones where there are different opportunities for these different mm, height requirements, setback requirements, frontage requirements. So the developer buys the rights to develop in that. They're, they're also property holders there. I mean, they're, they're owning the property and they're saying, right. I mean, I'm thinking in Hadley of some of these new condos that are going in that are really close to the road. You know, the one mm -hmm. like right on the road and it's enormous. And I have to think that must be, as a zoning person, I'm looking at that going, oh my God. So maybe that's part of it, right? Yeah, I can't say what it's that right at the bottom. I know, right at the bottom of the new development. And um, so, in a zone, they own the property, they want to go to a story taller. Yeah. And so, they buy the rights. Well, I think those condos are in Amherst. I thought they're right on the line. It's right at the bottom of the hill because yeah. Amherst kind of ends. Right, right where University Drive. But yeah. Oh, those are Amherst. Oh, they are. Okay. Go there are other, go ahead. other opportunities. Anyway, all I'm saying is that oh, it might be Amherst is doing the same thing. But um, affordable housing. But so what they're they're anyway. How does I, the mechanics are still beyond me? I'm not yes, kidding. that's a, the mechanics. If you could explain that a little bit more, Chris. Okay. About how. Yeah. So, so in the bylaw, there is a table which sets up a set of formulas, yeah. and so. For example, reducing your parking requirements by 20 spaces translates into X amount of square footage that you have to preserve in, in terms of farmland. There's a very specific set of numerical formulas that you, so if you, if you go, if you're, you find a 10 acre parcel of farmland and you buy those 10 development rights, that equals X number of parking spaces, X number of feet of, of increased height, or, or, or. There's, there's all different options and you can combine options. You can get you know, an increased height plus a reduced frontage. Um, I'd be happy to, you know, if we decide to pursue this further, I'd be happy to share with you an example of how that table yeah. works. Mm -hmm. And actually probably we'll try to create one for you mm -hmm. for Deerfield anyway, because that's part of our project. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can consider whether you think it might work for, for you all and, and for town. May I ask a, a question? This is Andrea. We have incentives for green um, 
development. How does this intersect with those incentives? Yeah. And how do they differ? I mean, I'm a little confused by. It's, it's a really good question. Um, and I don't, at this point, really have a total answer for you because it would really require some analysis to look at the, the incentives that we have created okay. for green development and make sure that we have some different incentives that might apply here. Although there might potentially be, a, you might be able to overlap those incentives and, and you know, someone might want to pursue green development or they might want to pursue transfer of development rights. You know, you, you could do either or potentially. Okay. So but I can't tell you exactly with precision which incentives are going to okay, conflict but, or overlap yeah, okay, until but we get into the table of, uh, okay. of all of that. So if someone wanted to, I, I'm, st I'm afraid I'm having a hard time understanding how, how this works. Yeah. Um, it's complicated. It is. <laughs> Agreed. It's okay. Um, so in order to build in one area, you have to provide a benefit in another place. Am I understanding that correctly? I think it's the other way around, isn't it? In order to build like, yes, in the town, you would provide, you would protect land. Right, somewhere right. else. Right, somewhere, somewhere else. Going away yeah. from one yes. area and promoting another. Right, right. and why, what is, what is the benefit to the, oh, uh, so the camp would be these incentives that we would, huh create yeah okay. it's really what smart growth you've heard this term before sure, smart growth is all about is trying to promote development in and around existing village centers at a higher density to create a more walkable community while preserving and protecting mm -hmm. some of the resource areas in the That's outer right. areas of the community maintaining the rural character of the community in, in so doing okay so that's what smart growth is and that's what that's what this bylaw accomplishes okay. really uh, so sort of both ends so uh, another question I have about is this uh, forested upland. Mm -hmm. Who owns it? Is some a lot of it owned by the state? Um, uh, certainly where I live, it is. So I'm just uh, wondering, how does right. that right. interact with all this? Yeah, well, the publicly owned land is protected, so we wouldn't be worried about that particular land. Um, it's the privately owned land that could be developed and, and really cut up into smaller parcels reducing the you know forest cover mm -hmm. and the and contiguous blocks of forest land that are really valuable at this point um, they're valuable not only for healthy soils but they're also valuable for example for wildlife um, we have you know one of the impacts of climate change is that wildlife is going to be migrating mm -hmm. moving northward yeah. species are going to be changing and, and having contiguous blocks of, of forest land are really important mm -hmm. for, for you know protecting wildlife habitat. Um, it's also important for carbon sequestration because the older forests are much more efficient at doing that than anything we could plant today. Um, you know, it takes like 35 years for a tree to get to the place where it's actually making a difference in terms of carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. um, so Kathy, you said you had a question and then Kathy. <laughs> yeah, so I, I I was just wondering how it worked like with this last couple, you know, they had land under chapter 61 and now they're paying taxes back so they can actually develop the land that was put in preservation. So what happens if a farmer, you know, the next generation wants to use that land? How do they, or can they um, yeah. somehow backtrack? Um, let me see if I can try to understand <laughs> your question. Um, so you know, it's interesting have... about Chapter 61A, first of all. Yeah. Um, the reason Chapter 61A is set up is to preserve farmland, not mm -hmm. just temporarily, but ideally long-term. Right. So frankly, it's a little disappointing that the town is turning around and, and not purchasing the 61A lands that are, are mm -hmm. getting released because there should be funds available for doing that. Um, that's part of what our CPA money is set aside for, and we should be using it um, to protect these lands. 61A, again, it's not set up as, a, as just a revolving door to get, give people a tax break. It's supposed to be to protect farmland in the long haul. So um, to answer your question, under, under this program, um, we would be purchasing development rights in perpetuity so the farm can remain in the hands of a farmer 
they get some money to reinvest in their properties and hopefully make their farm more viable, um, the land gets protected for the long term, and, and it's not like 61A, it's, it's permanently protected. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's... Yeah, I, there's no back door. No, no, no. Uh, well, <clears throat> let, me, let me answer that question completely. The, the truth is that the state legislature can vote to allow the release of a preservation restriction, but I don't think it's happened ever before or very rarely. It's uh, no, uh, the same as APR, APR is... Safe. It is the same as APR, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, so that would take something special would have to have happened to require it to, be, to get that to happen. You have other questions about this in particular? Uh, I'm still like getting a grip on this. So, so the mechanics table, so we're, we're incentivizing. And so some of the issues with building closer into town is that there's these requirements and these requirements make it difficult for an individual to build and develop in a manner that suits what they're seeking. But it seems to me like this table needs to be out first, right? Like we have to make those incentives present first before, so that that's what people are looking for, as opposed to looking somewhere else. Um, I mean, developers. I mean, developers. private developers. Right. Yeah. Or right. private in like if entities. It seems looking like we need to that's almost a starting point, right? Like, this is what we're going to offer you. Mm -hmm. This is what it looks like. These are the areas that are available for that. And um, it's like a promotion, it's like a marketing before we're trying to detract somebody, we're, in, we're attracting them. Well, and I'm looking at Alex too. Maybe Alex, do you have any sense for people, business people who are looking at your field who are saying, gosh, I would develop in town if I could go three stories or if I could have a mixed use. I mean, I'm just saying like, what is the, what is the reality on the ground? Not that, it, it, I mean, if you build it, they will come. I'm not saying we have to have some hot person, but what kinds of business developers, business owners would, do we have anything like that, that they're just clawing at the door saying, if only your rigs were, favorable to me? Uh, just curious. I... You have to go to the microphone if you're speaking. Sorry, I just, I'm just asking if there was any... Mm... I meant Alex. I could oh, hear you. He said no. <laughs> that was the answer. I also want to make one comment, if I may. Yes, Jen. Yeah. So Chris, Chris was saying that the, he wished the town would have used their right of purchasing the 61A. I want to just say on this case, it was a family member. The town decided that it wasn't a close enough family mem member to just have it by right, that they did want to do the right of first refusal um, process because it was a nephew. So it's family land. And it's not protected. It's just was the t it was the tax status was 61A. Correct. Yeah, I, you know, I think it just in general that, that I was trying to make the reference that that's what 61A is for, is to try to more permanently protect. Sure. Yeah, I think that that's probably that what they thought before and then life happens. So I that's just a state. I mean, that's a state tax status. That's not that's not the town per se, is it? Right. It's a state. We right. have the right to purchase it before because they had that. Tax, tax status. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, this is a good discussion. And I think um, maybe it ties into what um, Chris initially was wondering about is whether or not there's enough interest to uh, go back and talk with the Green Infrastructure Development Committee and to start exploring this more so that potentially you could bring back some proposed table of use, the overlay district, the, right. the bylaws to us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I'm trying to take the temperature of the planning board <laughs> right, a little bit right. to see whether there's interest. But this is something that, again, is part of the grant. We will be producing some model bylaws for your consideration, mm -hmm. and you can decide to pursue them or not. But I mean, I think it's helpful for me to get a sense of, you know, is this an idea that you 
have some interest in. Right. So, uh, this is Andrea. So the, the mixed use zoning would um, develop out of this. And we know that that's could seems to be could, could. right uh, uh, develop out of, and we know that that's of great interest to um, planning board members the town uh, okay or parking or trees or I don't know yeah <laughs> it depends on what the incentives would could well, be we I can do, get them to do a little work for us <laughs> I do think there's you know there's a dual benefit here with if you have the mixed use development as one of the incentives because the town center could really benefit from yes. some infusion of, of new growth and development and, and mixed use would bring people downtown. It would potentially upgrade, you know, the, the look of the downtown with some, some new development here. Um, you know, there, there's really a lot of, uh, a lot of benefits that could be had from doing that. That would require having a, a mixed use component to this bylaw, which is, is some work to do as well. But I think it's 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 good work and worthwhile. And I, yes, um, sorry, yes, Jen. Would Chris? I have a question for Chris. Would would that mixed use also be for other parts of town if the board decided that way, not just downtown? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that, that could be. You know, in, in other districts as well, if the board feels that's appropriate. You know. Yeah, I mean, I feel that that that's important depending on the the zone that it that people would want i mean there was somebody that you know wanted to have a project let's just say it was at magic wings and they wanted to use one of the other buildings and have a mixed use but it's not allowed in that area so they would have the business and then the residential part and um the way our bylaw is today it wouldn't be allowed so in that situation, you know, I think it's it's really worth looking at as a board to to put mixed use into um, into our bylaw. I'm understanding that this could be potentially some overlay districts and various. I mean, whether it's contigu contiguous or not. In those right. The, re the receiving zone is essentially the zoning overlay district, and, and it could mm -hmm. be comprised of you know multiple areas in mm -hmm. town. So. You know, Jen's example, I think, is a good one. Um, um, Chris, you had mentioned these other two areas that might be um, important for us. And we had talked also about having 15, 20 minutes to yes. hang the rest of the agenda. <laughs> so um, we could probably keep you here all evening. However, then what would we do with Andrea's fees? <laughs> um, so how would you like to proceed? Would you like to try to, would you like to come back to us on some of these other things? You want to go forward with, um, the conversation that we've had right now in terms of the transfer of development rights and um... well um, yes to, to both of those questions okay. I think I, I would like to you know I, I'm getting a, a positive sense on the, on the TDR uh, the, the other two might require another you know, half an hour worth of discussion to explain and, and get across yeah, so maybe a little we, bit. Should, yes. we should set up another time to <laughs> Good. do that yeah all right, good. Thank you. And I think the planning board, um, you know, as, as you know, we're doing a work group for um, our uh, accessory apartments. And if at some point you decide to have a work group comprised of a number of different parts of town, um, we could probably twist someone's elbow here to, to be part of that. Good. Great. Good. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Yeah. To be continued, yes. <laughs> Picture's worth a thousand words, yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, all righty, thank you. Next on our agenda, um, somewhat brief, but uh, potentially um, impactful. Um, as you received in the mail, um, we did receive a notice on, well, after April 25th from the Department of Housing and Community Development, DHCD, um, that they are looking at the um, towns, well, this is DHCD is from Massachusetts, Boston, and that's our state. Um, they're looking at our housing, um, subsidized housing inventory or our SHI. We've got a lot of acronyms today. Um, that uh, the, the letter states that um, we need to uh, look at the attached 
uh, subsidized housing inventory. And of course it was not attached um, to reply by June 4th um, as to whether or not there are any corrections, additions, uh, discussion. Um, uh, this is very much tied into our Deerfield housing production plan. Um, interestingly, um, Again, it, it's based on the 2010 census, not the 2020 census. And I, we did receive some um, backup information about, or there is some information that actually in our planning binders, I found um, our, our 2010 house, housing inventory, but not the subsidized housing inventory. So I spoke some with um, Casey, um, she is, uh, I, it's, it's the letter went to, the um, zoning board, us, um, her. And so she's going to, I, I was wondering whether or not the select board actually would take the lead on this since it impacts a number of different boards. So um, she said that she would bring that to the select board. And I, in fact, then just followed that up today with a request to be on the agenda for the select board. I think it's the May 18th. Um, uh, meeting that the select board could then discuss how they want to approach this <laughs> lack of the attached housing <laughs> inventory. <laughs> and also that there needs to be a response by June 4th. Um, I, I, I would probably say that my, my, if I say much of anything in the select board discussion, it would be that certainly the planning board wants to support um, both the writing of the response, however we can, but also the um, the actualization to see what we can do to actually make some some progress in that. And I'm not sure what that would be, other than um, addressing some of our zoning bylaws. Um, in previous presentations in FERCOG, um, part of the um, discussions that I think would be. Um, persuasive to the town is looking at accessory dwelling apartments, um, allowing two family in our RA district, um, allowing more three family units, multifamily units, um, and, and incentivizing affordable housing, potentially maybe incentivizing even as we were just talking, not quite sure how that could be, but in any event. So I think there are some things that are in our wheelhouse, um, although certainly we're not gonna be building <laughs> affordable housing ourselves. <laughs> yes, Denise. Thanks for questions. First one is, so I forget who I was talking, you know, after hearing this, and it's my understanding that neighboring towns are not meeting that requirement also. And the second part is, what is the enforcement? And the third part is, would senior housing, the proposed friendly 40B senior housing, would that constitute affordable housing. My understanding is uh, going backwards that definitely subsidized senior housing um, would okay. uh, count um, in terms of other towns. I think um, some are quite diligent about trying to monitor that and others are concerned that they're not at their 10% threshold. Um, and your third question well, was the enforcement. So, oh, okay. yeah. Well, I was looking, so, I was trying to now, find that. And um, I couldn't find, you know, I tried, to, I looked up 40B and, you know, it talks about what's non compliant. And it, I don't know what the teeth are. I, 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 don't, I don't know, other than I, I guess it would tie into not necessarily looking at what the enforcement. Problems a lot are, of times, let's see what we can do. <laughs> the enforcement isn't well. There's enforcement from the state, but there's also unfriendly development. That's another kind of enforcement uh, right. moment where um, unfriendly development comes into town and then triggers the. So that was well, at least when we were creating the housing um, plan, development plan before that. That was the threat. That that was the sort of Damocles over our head. Right, and my understanding with an unfriendly 40B is that they come in and there are a lot of our zoning laws that they don't need to comply oh. with. <laughs> and so we would want instead to be able to have our own subsidized And that's the thing with the senior housing when, when they were discussing it before, what we call the friendly 40B, which was 
where they would work with the town's people, the town boards. Still, they would have kind of these exemptions because we our housing inventory production plan isn't, and we haven't hit the threshold. Um, so a friendly 40B is great, <laughs> better than an unfriendly one. Right, and I, I would expect that if we're able to show that we've got the plans for the senior housing, if we're working on Toward. Accessory, accessory apartments, if we're also maybe considering some of the two family, three family initiatives. Correct. Um, that was what Alyssa's, that, that was her signal to us the, all those years ago when Paul and I were on that committee was that the plans that you make count in your favor. I mean, even as you're moving glacially toward it, you've got uh, you know, you've got your sight on the horizon, and that that was what we were really pushing with for with the accessory housing um, considerations. So, again, to be continued, but. Um, we might, the, the, as we were talking about setting our own agenda, it might be that our agendas are being set for us. Yes, <laughs> yes uh, So, um, like, do we know how many private Section 8 apartments, housing mm -hmm. units that we well, have? That, I think that's what was supposed that's to be what, attached. That's what we're trying to, right. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we know what, I, I think um, our goal, um, according to the, uh, the 2010 census, was that we have to have at least 30 um, because we have 3,000 and odd um, actual housing houses or inventory uh, units yeah. in the inventory. Yeah. So, and we're supposed to have 10%. So that would be 30. So I, I don't know where we are in relation to 30. And, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, so we have Elm Circle, we have the group home on Eastern Avenue. So there are things that we definitely know, but I'm curious if there's private private, like above the day loop. So there's an apartment above the day loop. There's a section eight apartment. There's a, there's a few apartments on South Main Street that are section eight. There was um, a house that sold a little while ago, but that was a section eight housing. So I'm curious if, I guess my question is, can an individual rent out an apartment in a building they own as section eight without it being registered with well, that's a that's very good question. question. Can you come on May 18th? <laughs> well, I, write that down, I think so I that's, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Uh, Anna Lee? Yes. Uh, so, yes. So Jen, I, Ann Mary had asked me this a long time ago. And did I ever give you that listing, Ann? No. Okay. So I have it somewhere in my piles. I called around to the different housing authorities as well as the couple of the other places that had affordable houses that, that you mentioned, Rachel, that I'm not recalling. And I, I came up at this number is just coming up in my head, like 35 units. And I was waiting for some of the other housing authorities to get back to me, but we were in the midst of COVID and I, let me look into it more because I started to, Anne Mary had asked me this question a while ago and I started to call around and see what our inventory actually look like. So they're not per se registered with the town of Deerfield, but they have to be associated with a program that then. Yes, I think that makes them official. Right. 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 I think, uh, Jen, that will be research well, <laughs> time well spent because. Well, I've done it and it's somewhere and I was waiting. We yeah, I was respond. waiting for people their boards. So um, committee, I mean, housing authorities to get back to me because right. some, some of the housing authorities, like, so let's say you go to the Northampton Housing Authority and they have a, a apartment that's Section 8 in Deerfield. So that's how, you know, so I went to the Greenfield one and the Amherst one because we don't have our own housing authority. So, but they oh. register properties that are in Deerfield. So that's why I was trying to find Mm -hmm. housing authorities in other towns that had properties that were in Deerfield. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Well, again, hopefully it will be on um, the May 18th select board meeting because otherwise I think their meeting is after June 4th or something like that. So, and whether or not June 4th, how that's all that is, but in any event, great. Good. Um, can we try not to um, have individual conversations? Rachel, did you have something? I, I, this was Andrea. I was asking if the, <laughs> that's my bad, if the <laughs> Franklin Regional Housing Authority would have such a listing. Yes. yes. 
Yeah. We just need to <laughs> get the listing. Uh, and Mary uh, and then um, Kathy, ahead. did no, you have something? No. Well, my question is, could, Kathy, oh, sorry, okay. sorry, it's Kathy. Could there be different listings by town, right? So Northampton maybe has some listings, but maybe Amherst has some listings, maybe Greenville. That's right. So that's why I called down. Well, that's why, right. that's why, how, that's that's why regional authority. Yeah. authority. That's what I meant. That's, that's what you have to go but, through there. Yes. Hi, and Mary? Mary <laughs> that was the um, question. What I, I was a section eight landlord for a brief time. Okay. So okay. my renter mm -hmm. um, found their own um, listing, right? right? Whatever mm -hmm. apartment happened to fall under the criteria of enough bedrooms for enough rent that it was, it could be considered a section eight housing. Okay. And then they would go to whoever gave them their benefits, whether it was out of Springfield or Northampton or Greenfield. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's registered there and not with us. Because they go through their, where right. their services are given. Sure. So they don't have to go through Greenfield. They so, can go right. through Springfield, but end up renting here, but still get their benefits from through the Springfield office. And that's where the record's kept. Correct. Mm -hmm. So really we're looking for an aggregate, but that, that, yeah, but that whole, whole number yeah. could be yes. through like 10 different municipalities. Correct. Or more. Yeah. Or more. Well, because yeah. I like think section, section, benefits benefits through 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 section eight is you can take it across the country. Yeah. Isn't that right? So I mean, it could be <laughs> originate <laughs> anywhere. I would oh boy. All right, so, Jen, you've got so, your... <laughs> so, yeah, so, yes, so, Denise. Okay, so in that case, it sounds like that I mean, that's a lot of research and that's continual research in order to meet this goal. So is that something that the town could say any section eight needs to register with the town right. to make it easier? I mean, and with the, you know, with the housing authority say, yeah, that's great. We want to do this, but we need to know. And that, mm -hmm. that way we wouldn't have to go chasing these numbers. All I honestly don't know how that works because well, I think it, that's a good question to ask. It would make our lives a lot easier. Who do you ask it up? So who would they register with, given that we have no housing authority? <laughs> I think, I mean, we, we, we wouldn't. The yeah. problem is, of course, it would have to be volunteer. <laughs> or, or at least go to the Franklin, you know, regional housing authority. That's what I think. At least, at least just do that. Have an ad, you know. There. But honestly, that's a kind of a, it's a difficult process because how would the each individual housing authorities even know? And it may not even be a housing authority. It may be in, I don't know. I don't know how. Or if it's like Ann Mary was saying individuals. Right. Yeah. Like, right. So I don't know because I mean, it would have to be, um, and we don't even have an apartment inventory. Well, I was just going to say, was it, were we also, this was one of the ADU things that we thought we might be scooping up at the same time was to create an inventory, an apartment inventory. Right. So that we had some sense of what apartments were available in our town. Just I mean, that's, that's opening up a whole different ball game. I mean, you know, it's like if you register your apartment in Deerfield, you could probably have a checkbox. But I mean, I was hired as the rental first rental permitting person in Amherst. So they charged a hundred per hundred dollars per application per didn't matter if you had 250 units or one unit, you had to register your property. And that was my first job in Amherst. So they had to meet criteria for their apartments and register that we knew that they had a owner, they had maintenance people, they had a bunch of criteria and they paid a hundred dollars. Board of health and all that. <laughs> yeah. It would, you know, you had this checklist that you had to go through. So, I mean, it would be a way, I don't know how we would have the staff and, you know, person power to, to manage that because I mean, but it would be a way to get an inventory. And well, was there good compliance um, sorry, in Amherst? Yeah. Very good. Okay. I mean, they had to, <laughs> but it, um, but it also came for all in-law apartments had to be registered, um, everything. And so we found like tons of illegal apartments, but the, you know, you had an entire one whole building inspector position that I mean, there was five building inspectors you know, to, to go and to, you know, look at these illegal apartments and. 
Well, I imagine as Jen is um, just looking for our uh, subsidized housing inventory, uh, it will be a Pandora's box that will present other opportunities <laughs> for um, sort of spiffing up our, our bylaws and our internal processes. But, but if we had something else that it wasn't like a, a charge, hmm. like we weren't inspecting it or having a whole, you know, another whole ball game, but you had to okay. register your apartment with the town as far as if it was, I don't know, rental or section eight, you know, like we had little check boxes. I'm just sort of thinking out loud, like how we could do this without it, people getting scared away from more fees and more regulation or I don't know, just so that we could then have an inventory of what we actually have in town, which is probably way more than we even know. Right. And, and Mary, and then Peggy, we should try to. Yeah, I don't want to belabor the point, but I think if we make it really burdensome for people to provide affordable housing, we're going to mm -hmm. be able to provide less affordable housing. So I guess I don't want to get then, too mired down. Right. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is a good first step is to actually try to find out what do we have now. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then we'll take it from there. Um, Andrea and then maybe uh, yes. I was going to ask whether or not there is a census of housing stock period. So yes. homes, apartments. Well, that's what, I mean, like, what was, that's what we were that's supposed in to. A, in a oh. planning binder, I guess I didn't bring it with me. There is a, um, a, a yeah a statement that we have something like 3022 housing units as of uh, the 2010 census that's all the ones that we know of that <laughs> right but that was yeah that's what the state is considering our housing census is and so we have to have 10 percent of that is supposed no. to be subsidized yeah. housing i'm inventory. just thinking with the um the town census that we have to do regularly mm -hmm. for voting purposes mm -hmm. etc do we ask do you, you know, where do you live in a house, an apartment, or do you have a section eight? Um, no, we don't I guess the question that. is what's the pro and con? Like, what's the incentive for people to come forward with it? Does it alter their tax base, their property tax? Their, you know what I'm saying? Like, is there, is there incentive to stay That's in the shadow or yes. is there incentive to come forward and say, this is what I have? Like, what? is offered for Well, these them. might be good questions, especially if we find that we're under our uh, 10% and we yep. want to beat the bushes and find out, wait a second, are there other ones there that um, we in, don't know about? It's my, in my experience that people are, would rather not say mm -hmm. if they yeah. have apartments because of their tax rate or, you know, declaring um, their income, or, whatever it is, it's, it's multi-layered. Sure. So, all right. Well, another one to be continued. <laughs> sure. Um, and this one was a to be continued. Um, next on our agenda is a discussion of the Mullen Rule. Um, one of the uh, Citizen Planner Training Collaborative CPTC webinars that I attended did mention that only board members who attend and hear evidence at all sessions of a public hearing can vote, with the exception being the Mullen rule. And uh, so Denise and I were scratching our heads about Mullen rule, and Denise has followed through uh, with some information um, in regards to Deerfield and our Mullen rule exception. Yeah, so I found out, I'd, I'd asked Casey this question, Casey and Jen, and then I had another conversation with her, and apparently, Let's see, in order for that to be in effect for the town, it has to be voted in and accepted. And it was on April 30th, 2017, Article 25. So it's the Mullen Rule procedure. It's available to, for use by the board. Um, and there's also- Which board, us board? Any, yeah, okay. our board, any, any board, select board across, across the board. And so there's, <laughs> there's an actual um, document that, that you fill out. So. If you weren't here, Watch if you weren't at one of the meetings, I think it's just one meeting. If you weren't there, then you do have to fill out a form attesting that you have you know, listened to the Zoom, you've looked at the minutes and that you're familiar with it enough. And, and also that it was not a really substantial meeting that there was a lot of information. That you missed. Okay. So I do, I mean, I have. Excellent. So um, like we're, we're covered. 
So what we need to do is make sure that we get this in our binders and also mentally distribute it to all of us. And yeah. thank goodness for the uh, big public hearing part. The playing fields parks that we've got before us. Everyone here has attended you know. either virtually or in person all of the hearings. Yeah. Um, but even then, so and you just what we need is to have a folder with the format. We used to I'll, we've used I'll, these before. Right. I'll send this on to Annalee. I think and this I think this really. happened when we were um, dealing with Dollar General. I mm. think no, was, it happened was before then. Oh, it was before yeah. then. Okay. So all this right. is to justify your vote that you yeah. are. Right, but you, right to justify your did vote. You okay. I never did it. You did your homework for the, the one on the meeting that you missed mm. <laughs> okay. for a public hearing? Excuse me. Um, do you have a question? I, so yes, <laughs> we're trying to not I have on the side know, comments. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> Go ahead. Wondering if I had missed the public hearing when I was bereaved. No. No. Yeah, we've had a few yeah. off and on, so Great. we're okay. all Just set. Thank I'll you. Send this to you. Thank you. Um, Can I ask the question? Uh, yes, Kathy. So, if you have, a, if we haven't been sworn in, like if we haven't been sworn in, Ooh. we vote on anything right now. Oh, oh I, was sworn in. So, I haven't been sworn in yet. I haven't got. So you're abstaining. I'm abstaining. I just need yep. to. I remember that. Yeah. So. Oh, so you have to like be resworn in. Tomorrow. And congratulations. Yes, yes. Yes. Our, yes. I just, I was just talking to my head. Get your little tushy down there. <laughs> it's sworn in. I know, I will. For re election, you have to be sworn in each time? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I just haven't been. I was like, well, I Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. All right. And again, congratulations. This is Thanks. Very exciting. Yes. Crazy people. Um, and uh, somewhat related to that, um, this is uh, this is a very quick agenda item. Um, I did send out um, a, a sort of a new sheet. It was a surprising how many, maybe not surprising, how many different boards and committees um, many of us, all of us, uh, are on either through appointment or election. And in general, um, as you could see from the um, from the. Uh, grid that I sent out, most of these um, terms are renewed in June. So at our June 6th meeting, um, we'll plan on having reappointments for um, appointments for our different committees and also elections of our officers. So um, please individually let me know if there's a committee you'd like to be on or if there's a an office that you would like to hold. And um, uh, and also I will maybe try to talk with each of you kind of like a, an annual assessment, how are, what's going well for you? What what would you like to see different? It's our annual performance review here. <laughs> it just gets so bureaucratic, but um, so I look forward to talking with you and also think about um, other committees and groups and ways you can continue to be strong members of the planning board. Um, old business, uh, and we're moving into Andrea's long-awaited fee schedule. Andrea, um, and, and really as a, um, I mean, <laughs> preceding intro for that, uh, way back when we did um, start with our, some of our initiatives, what are things we'd like to do? Some would be zoning bylaws and whatnot, and, and then others are processes, and we've, we've checked off a number of those processes, but looking at our fee schedule was um, one that I know that town has requested and that we wanted to do too. So, Andrea. Yes, thank you to um, Denise and, um, and to Jen for working um, on this with me. Uh, we compared the fees charged by several towns uh, to our own fee schedule and uh, thought about whether or not they should be changed. We are supposed to look at these things um, annually. I believe it's been a while, uh, but we are now looking at them. Um, the table that I sent to everybody shows um, uh, what, when I said uh, a column that says Deerfield recommended, which in fact is um, perhaps uh, recommendations um, that I have received from people and, the, and with my input. And, uh, and these are basically my recommendations that we would need to vote on. Uh, 
but again, I had input from a variety of sources, including the building inspector, including Jen, and looking at these other towns' fees. So yeah. there are not many changes that we believed would be necessary mm -hmm. with um, the exception of the definitive subdivision and modification to a definitive subdivision. I did ask how often does this come up and it's not that often, but it does happen occasionally and we were wildly uh, lower mm -hmm. than most of the other towns. And so um, it was um, you know, uh, suggested that we increase the, uh, the fee. Um, I, ch I believe that um, it would be easier to do $100 per lot when I talked to um, Bob, you know, Inspector Bob, about um, figuring out the uh, additional little fee, you know, the $10 per 100 square feet. We looked at the condos, uh, the Snowberry condos, and every lot was a different size. Yeah. And so we started doing um, averages and it just seemed onerous. And so I, and since other towns just said $100 per, per um, lot, lot, I thought that that would be um, a more expeditious way of determining fees, thus the change. And then there's a question about the modification to a definitive subdivision. And right now we had been playing, we've, we've been charging nothing. And we think that that's not appropriate, especially given other towns are charging that uh, a lot more than nothing. <laughs> um, and then the, um, the, it, the thing to think about is that this is not a money maker for the town or for the planning board specifically, because the money would come to the planning board, but it's um, recognition of the time it takes for administrative help. Um, not just sometimes our work, uh, if we go to, um, you know, a site plan review, or if we um, take the time to travel to a place where a special permit is used. And since we are volunteers, our time is not exactly charged, but uh, other, you know, staffers for the town do spend time and time is money. <laughs> and so it costs uh, something. So that is why, um, why we have fees period and why we thought that the fees that were here would be appropriate. Given that there are not changes to anything except the definitive subdivision and the modification to a definitive subdivision, we would have to hold a hearing. If we change any of these fees, we'd have to have a public hearing. And so mm -hmm. I wonder if planning board members are would be in agreement with this. And if so, then we would need to set up a, a public, public hearing. Maybe if we could see first for site plan review, or if we can go through these, there aren't too many. Sure. We're saying um, $250 for site plan, re plan review plus $10 per 100 square feet. Are people right. comfortable with that? Time. We're the only ones that seem to have the square foot thing. Right, and we, if we decided we wanted to add um, per lot or if we wanted to remove the, the, um, the additional charge beyond the 250, we could do that. So what's the reason for the additional? I can't. Discriminating between a bigger project and a smaller project, I think. You know, a smaller project, no big deal. A bigger project, yeah. that's more, you know that there's more involved. And there's more involved, yeah. right? And the, um, General, more involved, yeah. generally. Part of my conf confusion, and maybe this, you know, we should discuss this 10 per ten dollars per 100 square feet, is it's often disturbed yeah. property. And that's like, the what problem. constitutes disturbed? Is it if you have a big lot and it's where the House is going. Is that the area that's disturbed, or is the whole? So either we could think about um, removing this extra part, the ten dollars per hundred square feet, or saying total lot size ten or ten dollar or a or hundred dollars per lot. I don't. Uh, Except that it's not a lot. I mean, that's yeah. so that's not about lots. You know, whereas subdivision is about lots. That makes it different. True. So, um, so perhaps we should we could think about Denise has got some. You know, I was just going to say, you know, I mean, talking about disturbed, it's like, once again, who enforces that? You know, is Bob going to go out there and say, and, and measure how much you, did you disturb? So we're going to charge you X amount. I would just do a flat fee. Okay. Or, for, or per So lot. raise I it? In fact, it's range. way too complicated. Yeah. So maybe, we, so we should remove that. I have to say, I didn't, I, um, yeah. 
I didn't think that um, through. No. For, for um, I remember when it came up over solar and we like, you got this great big solar array, but the only disturbed property oh, with, that's with the pole. Was the pole. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's like that's like, yeah, right. covered three yes, acres. I mean, right. and in fact, these have been in place since 2008. And um, to my knowledge, our 250, which is more than everybody else, is, hasn't been problematic. So no. if we were to keep it at 250, but without that $10 per hundred square foot, is that what people are tending towards? That's fine. And, and I would guess the same would be the uh, case with the special special. Permit. So permit. other towns don't have any kind of, uh, for or like a, a larger, no. Okay. So no. as Andrea yeah. says, for a special permit, do we want to have that also be the same? Hatfield is a little bit more, mm -hmm. others are less, same. Yeah. No. 250 and then take away the ten dollars per hundred square foot is that, that i think to be consistent yes consistent yeah all right thank it's you consistent. simpler okay Simpl uh, and good. are at 100 plus 50 dollars per lot now the for an a and r the lots are fairly clear right i mean it's that's what's happening they're changing it into one or two or two, yeah, two right. to one. That's the problem. That's when it goes the other direction. So people seem okay with that? Yeah. I think so. I don't think we've the ever way run into now, a big issue with ANS. Yeah. Okay. Just and then the preliminary subdivision. Um, we're the, in, well, we're not quite the lowest, but we're quite low. Preliminary subdivision, that's just when, what, so that so Jen can probably answer this. This is what yeah. I'm and, and, oh, and talk about. I'm here. Okay. Okay. Um, start. You know, it's the initial planning for uh, a subdivision, and um, then Jen says to them, "Do you have this? And do you have that? Yeah. And do you have this information?" Yeah. So she. It's before it actually reaches um, us. I. I yeah. If I'm understanding. Oh, correctly. like the pre. Yeah. Well, yeah, we do the pre submittal meeting and then it's all the abutters notices. And then it's the, you know, it's like Bob's time for making sure everything's on the plans. And um, there's just a lot more entailed with the subdivisions. So the range seems to be 25 to 300. I, it, it, I'd say, I mean, they're making money, it's their business. It's not like sure. it's a cost of doing business. Sure, sure, yeah. And so and the cost of doing business is engaging our townspeople and making sure that they're doing it the right way. I mean, I, I don't know that we have to go to the top of the line, but I, I don't see what any would reason you suggest, to Rachel? What would you suggest? Because it, this is the preliminary stuff. So once they have a definitive subdivision, then, it's then they're paying the, the $500 plus $100 a lot. Uh -huh. So $200, and then that puts their foot in the door. So how much? Okay, so this is for two hundred, and there's not any plus extra. Well, the the extra is if consultants are, need to be, right. and then that's and that's part of our um, uh, our usual uh, process peer, anyway. If we have review. to hire consultants to um, peer to review do, their right. their work, so they have to pay. They uh, the applier has to pay for that, or um, if we want a um, a second opinion or. A, review of their um their consultants and it costs us something that cost will okay. be borne by them as well so okay, it's so like 200 okay and <laughs> <laughs> um, sold uh, uh, and the definitive once. subdivision it, it's to make it more in line with other towns and the modification. Well, wait, wait, wait. Oh, Definitive. I mean, I'd say more than 200. Everything else, there's 500, 500, 500. 500. 500. For a definitive Definitive's subdivision. 500. Right. Right, right, right. And, and what are you thinking? Line. You don't have to remodel. Oh, well, I have a different one. Yeah, yeah. so there's yeah. Deerfield recommend. Well, there we go. That's okay. <laughs> Mine's older, I guess. Okay, so 500? That's what we said, plus $100 per lot. Yeah. Cool, okay. okay. Plus $100 cool. per cool. lot. Okay, yes. okay. Okay. The chair says cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get that soup. Oh, oh, yeah. That's acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and it, as I said, we were not charging anything for a modification to a definitive subdivision and Everybody else was, or many towns were. And so we thought that was appropriate. 
and one town is charging subdivision regulation. We are not quite sure what that is. And so is that an ongoing fee? I don't know. Do you know Jen? No? $15. So it's it's I don't $15. know. <laughs> that, what town was that? I don't have it in front of me. Greenfield for subdivision regulation. I don't know. Yeah, and no one else yeah. is doing it. Yeah. Let's just not do it. So I can, I, can, I can resubmit <laughs> these numbers to everyone so that they have a final um, Thank you. version. Um, in, in advance and then of we would need mm -hmm. to talk about uh, having a public hearing. Well, about or, these I mean, I think we could, um, there's not that many numbers here right now if we want to um, vote it on it and then probably have the public vote to have the public hearing on June 6th. We have our May 19th is um, the... the Plainfield Park. I will not be here. Pardon just, me? I will not be present on June 6th. Just so you know, you can do it. I'm just saying. It sounds like it's Jen, did you say that Casey wasn't going to be here too? Casey leaves on Tuesday or Wednesday, but she doesn't necessarily come to planning board meetings. So I don't know if, because I won't be there if she's, she's on, we're both on vacation. We planned it really really well this year um the same we, week i think we should be fine for june yeah, yeah. june for 6th um, so for Andrew, if, or, if you want to just go um actually if you want to make a motion to so i get to make a motion prove it and state the fees that you All that right. we discussed i move that we adopt the following fees for the different um Things that the, the planning board um, can can charge fees uh, for <laughs> application. I'm sorry. Application. Applications. These are for applications. So, uh, site plan review, two hundred fifty dollars. Special permit, two hundred fifty dollars. A and R, one hundred dollars plus fifty dollars per lot. Preliminary subdivision, two hundred dollars plus cost of, of consultants if necessary. Definitive subdivision, $500 plus $100 per lot. Modification to definitive subdivision, $250. Could we have a second? I second it, Kathy Sylvester. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Good work. Good job, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so oh. let's have a About. call to question. Uh, Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. Kathy Petrova. Kathy Petrova, yes. Andrew uh, Leibson. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Oh. Oops. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoopsie doopsie. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Andrew Leibson. Andrew Leibson, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. And Mary Cloutier. And Mary Cloutier, yes. And we'll throw, yes, thank you very much. And Annalise, thank you very much. Yes. Can I just, for the record, I really I didn't work. I mean, I was at one meeting, but Andrea really did the bulk of the work with Jen. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. Both. Thank you. Yeah. Andrea did it. Also, and you're voted so. to do it next year again. <laughs> Apparently, we have to do it every year. <laughs> thank you. One of the things we, we don't also, always have to change the numbers. <laughs> exactly. One of the things we, we also noticed as we were looking at this is um, that we have one, two, three, four, six pages of. Oh. regulations governing fees and fee schedules that also was adopted May 5th, 2008. And it's uh, quite a bit of, um, uh, you call it government D's, <laughs> legalese. Um, and so um, actually moving into one of our, actually our next uh, discussion. Um, oh, wait a minute, this be, before we leave that, so once we've had our, um, oh, our hearing, we will also have to change this the regulations yeah, governing fees and fee schedules. We'll, we'll have to um, vote on updating this. Yes. At that meeting. Whenever after the public after, hearing. After the public hearing and after we have um, had a final um, vote on this. Are you thinking then that we should not put our new fee schedule in 
into place until we have this document updated. No, I think we have to first have the um, public hearing, the public right, hearing. Right, right. and then once we have, you know, voted on this for final time after the public hearing, then this will uh, document will also need to be updated because it lists the fees on the second page. So wouldn't it also make sense, unfortunately, that this needs to be part of the public hearing? Yeah. The whole oh, document? document? What document are you looking at? I'm looking at the site plan review application packet 263 attachment six. There's all those things too, but what I'm looking at also is um, in section 18.7 of our planning board binder mm -hmm. is a six page uh, document of regulations governing fees and fee schedules. And so that should be part of the hearing. So actually, let me check with the council on that because we have several different locations that our fees are in. Just want to make sure that we are updating them in the appropriate place during this hearing. Right. We would have to uh, update all the app fee application sheets. Yep. So potentially then um, perhaps what we need to do as our only other agenda item on May 19th is just an update as to whether or not we can have the public hearing governing just the fee numbers without also updating mm -hmm. this yeah. fee regulation document. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to check on that. Okay, thank you, Jen. I don't think we have to vote on the date for the public hearing anyway, but at least we got the, the numbers down. Okay. But yeah, so, you so, know, just, just, I mean, we're gonna have to have that. I don't think what. so because actually, well, I mean, I think that going through these six pages, I've just skimmed this, it's quite complex. I don't know how much of this is still necessary. I mean, this is from 2008. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we potentially need some assistance with this or. Right. These are planning board regulations. Yeah. Do we, yeah, do we have to um, have the public understand that? Yes. Okay. Seems like it. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we're not quite there yet, but hey. So Jen, you will, you will follow up on that and let us know. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> All righty. And tied into that, um, as I think everyone here knows that <clears throat> with our town meeting results, um, we did, uh, the town did vote to approve um, <clears throat> our $11,000 request for assistance for a planning technician, consultant planning technician. Um, so <laughs> very, very happy that that's a step in the right direction, hopefully for getting a, full-time planner. Um, I did talk with Casey about um, the PBCP contract. That would be the next, the people that we are anticipating we'll have the technician from Pioneer Valley Planning Corporation. Um, and um, Jen um, gathered some information on um, other contract at contracts and scopes of work um, for a planning technician. So um, Casey suggested that Jen and I move forward to um, draft the contract and the scope of work. Seems that the planning board, we've had a lot of, I mean, this is good. We've had a number of conversations already about some of our desired um, initiatives and priorities and whatnot. So I think we've got a good, a good start on that as a group. My, I would anticipate that after Jen and I um, have some conversations that we would um, come back potentially at the June 6th meeting um, for the planning board to review the draft scope of work um, and contract. After June 6th. Pardon me? You said after June 6th. Oh no, at June 6th. At June hopefully 6th. July 1st is when we can get started. 
because it it was approved. I mean, we can get started. Yeah, no, whenever, great. But yeah, yeah. So um, so if in the meantime, if you have any other burning issues that you think weren't um, given the proper ear in some of our previous discussions, please let either Jen or I know. Um, let me know um, so we can consider and you know and entertain that for the scope of work in the contract that we then uh -huh. need to bring back, Denise. Yeah, just a question. So, so if we um, we use their services, then they'll be looking at all the zoning bylaws and the master plan that we have, so that we'll be able to they'll be able to help us prioritize and move forward. That if that's what we decide is in the scope of services, okay. that's what we ask. <laughs> yeah. We have to determine. Yeah, right. So we're right. determining what, what we falls under the purview of yeah. the plan. Okay. So, Kathleen, step one. what is the um, number of hours the budget? Well, it's uh, it's eleven grand, and I think that we figured out, Jen, didn't we? That that's only about eighty hours, which is like two and a half hours a week. So, right. um, we're going to have to really be very um, disciplined <laughs> with yes. how we can. And I think from that standpoint, you know, as we're thinking about, you know, update the master plan for five hours. Uh, no. <laughs> well, you know, my, my thoughts are looking at the master plan because there are five different segments to the master plan. And, and so we should really take a look at that and prioritize what needs to be updated first. And in my mind, you know, probably economic development would be <laughs> one of the top things to do. So, you know, so I think the more we can focus in, the more we can... Absolutely, yeah. The so more, those will be the kinds of things that I think. Um, no, most likely, Jen and I will have. I mean, we'll try to be as disciplined as we can, but probably our list will be a little bit longer than what it will allow. So we'll bring that back and have some conversation here. That's well, also part. the. Um, excuse me. May I speak? Yes. <laughs> um, the planner will also be able to give us an idea of how many hours for maybe some of the different scope of work. You know how how long they would think it would take. I mean, they first have to familiarize our, themselves with our zoning bylaw and and look at our scope and say, okay, I can do this in so many hours and this in so many hours and, and give us an idea of what would be the best use of our time money. All right, yes, good. Yeah, that, that will be very valuable because as you say, they might have a better sense of how long it will take them to do things than what yeah. we would suspect. But very, very nice, very nice. Bravo. <laughs> and thank you, town, for voting on this, right? Yes. Yep. And the finance committee for supporting it and everybody for <clears throat> trying to. Kudos to the finance committee, really, because mm -hmm. they had a tough job. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, <clears throat> so, our accessory bylaws work group. Um, it is going to be happening. We have members appointed from the ZBA, Planning Board, Select Board, Finance Committee, the Building Commissioner, um, and then Chris will be on it also. Um, May 26th um, will be our, our first meeting. I'm, hope, I'm actually anticipating that we'll be, you know, potentially two or three meetings at the most, um, and having it be certainly valuable because this will be an opportunity for these um, <clears throat> members to bring forward what they think might be concerns and also to take back to their respective boards and committees just as is done in CCI um, so that we can in fact get some more feedback and public engagement. Um, I, I am looking at them as um, helping flesh out the issues that this would not necessarily this would not be a committee that is um, going to be rewriting the bylaws and um, sort of um, um, making we they'll be making suggestions for us as we then reconsider um, the, the bylaws I will say I attended today I'm skipping ahead into our committee reports um, I attended today a uh, citizen planning, uh, uh, citizens housing and planning association chapter meeting, <clears throat> making the case on um, affordable housing. Um, and it was really quite sobering in terms of all the strategies that different towns are trying to employ to address basically the NIMBY, not in my backyard issues. Um, and 
and uh, some of the towns have been incredibly sophisticated in uh, in working for accessory apartments as well as affordable housing. Um, and some some of them with my success recently, Wellesley, uh, Newton, good success, Brookline, no. Um, I mean, those are very different towns from us, but um, in any event. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to say, I just <clears throat> want to, I'm not sure how to put this. <clears throat> um, on social media and also in person, there is a part of our town who is virently, you know, anti-rental um, and anti um, not, you know, if you don't own property here, sort of, and I, I just wanna, uh, you know, sort of take a moment to recognize that that's part of our town too, that like, we all, I mean, I, I don't speak for anybody else, um, wasn't aware of it, that people had really strong feelings against renters in this town. So, you know, I just wanted to put that out there that there's, there are vocal people who feel that way. So while we work on these things, I don't know, I just want to keep that in mind that not everybody, mm -hmm. you know, well, then isn't that a challenge as we're saying we want to have community engagement and that means community engagement from, well, from everyone. <laughs> sometimes people who have dissenting voices are less likely to say it. And so, although I don't, I think that there's room for renters in our town. I think it's important to have it said that not everybody agrees with that. Mm -hmm. And that some people are gonna, I, I don't know if they're gonna show up, but you know, I think that's an important voice to hear too. I want to say. Well, I think again for us to try to figure out how we can understand those issues also and try to address them. For sure. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, yeah, I, I mean, I'm on social media as well, and I do monitor what goes on. I very rarely comment <laughs> uh, for things like that. But you know, as far as I'm concerned, if if there are individuals who are concerned about that, then they should really show up at meetings. Mm -hmm. And instead of wasting their time putting negative comments on social media, because I think it's really counterproductive to how we're trying to move forward. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe we have any other business, um, not anticipated in 48 hours. And um, unless Alex or um, anyone on Zoom has a public comment, please limit to two minutes, <laughs> non repetitive. <laughs> No, okay. There's no one online. <laughs> Excuse me, hidden in the corners. <clears throat> um, reports of seminars, meetings that people have gone to. I'll start with, I don't know, uh, mainly going around Rachel, Kathy. Uh, I was at an open space meeting this past week. So we are continuing to meet regularly. We are still working on big documents, <laughs> many pages to few. Well, thank you. And um, I'm also on our senior housing ad hoc committee and we're having, actually I should say this is an announcement, we're having a lot of difficulty getting um, <clears throat> good result or good feedback for a senior housing survey that just went out. Um, it's for people 55 and older many people are confusing this with a senior center survey mm -hmm. that went out uh, several months ago. And so we're having, um, uh, at this point, it's only 6% um, response. So bravo again to open space for your, uh, for the, the meeting. Where is it? Where is it? Down. I go to the transfer station and hand people pieces of paper that tell them how to do uh, the survey. Uh, That's what I would response. recommend. That's what. That's part of why the Senate. open space committee. Yeah, we should not to, not to renters. <laughs> <I'll pass that laughs> on. Right. Yeah, yeah, there were postcards, but in any event, I'll pass that on. Um, uh, Denise, or no, I was just going to mention. So, if you, you know, people who are confused, I know this has been posted and reposted. Um, because it was sent at, in a postcard and then there's a specific number on it. So they just don't want re repetition. So for some reason, someone wants to fill it out. They didn't get the postcard. You can get in touch with Lily and she can give you an identification number. It's not to find out 
who you are. It's just to just keep to track. Sure it's and that information is on the town website. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. And on Facebook. Yes. I mean, the town Facebook page. Yes. <laughs> Zuckerberg has our <laughs> survey, <laughs> right? It um, works. Right, that's right. Um, I also did uh, actually today or yes, I know, last week uh, a CPTC um, webinar on overlay districts, which um, you know was similar to what Chris was talking about earlier with this overlay district of these incentives. Um, a couple of things that came forward is that uh, and that that overlay districts seem to be. I mean, this is. Present, the presenter saying that overlay districts are very attractive to developers, they like that, um, and that residential is the number one incentive developers look for, especially in underutilized town centers. They wanna see residential as, a, as an incentive. And also- As an the, incentive to building? I mean, as an incentive for in, them to- For, for zoning, for zoning, uh, yes, for zoning, regulations in underutilized town centers if we you know mixed use including Got the it. residential is a, a very favorable incentive apparently for many developers um and then also the other piece of advice was to try to make it simple uh, the simpler the red regulation the more attractive it is to developers and the more likely it is to pass um, what was it? Oh gosh, I haven't heard how it is, but Montague had a, wow, what was there? I should remember what the zoning law was. And it was something like 35 pages. I mean, it was huh. huge huh. At, for their town meeting. Wow. wow. And they did just have their town meeting. Pardon me? Did they just have their town meeting? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. I forget. I think it might have been for um uh, for some mixed, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't remember. Yeah, it's like I was no. old. Thirty-five pages for one bylaw. I think they had an overlay district, didn't they? That they were Maybe that was it. Mm -hmm. An overlay district for Can some I, type of housing. Yeah, after about twenty minutes of one person speaking, I gave up. Right. <laughs> Was it? What, it was for housing. It was for some kind of housing, right? I like our two minutes. No, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, well, it was I think the overlay district was getting too close to his property. I think yeah. wasn't that? Did you see that? But it's an overlay district for housing of some sort. It was a really it was memorable news. webinar. I mean, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so. I, I checked. That. Okay, um, any other reports? Oh yes, Denise. No, excuse I'll me. report on CCI. Well, first of all, I think what, I went to the climate forum. I, I can't remember whether I reported on that or not, but the climate forum, which I thought was really, really interesting. But what was even more interesting is that prior to that, um, Tim Hilchey from CCI wrote a letter, um, a very comprehensive letter on how we are not getting money that we should be getting here in Western Massachusetts. And he sent the letter, we sent the letter to, uh, let's see, to Jim McGovern, to Richie Neal, and to Karen Polito, and we CC'd Natalie, and we CC'd Joe. And so what I did is I made copies of that letter, and I also put the, the postcard of all the priorities that we've identified in CCI in an envelope and handed it to Joe and handed it to Natalie. To date, we've not heard anything back from him. Then I also went to, and I think, at, at that, I think Carolyn had spoken to um, Joe at that meeting, you know, and, and talked to her about that. But still, we haven't heard anything back to date, um, although they say they really support what we're doing. And then I also went to the Western Massachusetts Mass Municipal Association Conference, and they were there. Oh, maybe it was at that one. And, you know, Carolyn did speak. So I think what we, the plan is to, <laughs> actually invite Karen Polito and Jim McGovern separately out here and to talk about the disproportionate amount of infrastructure money that we have not gotten mm -hmm. according to you know the state. I think it's like, I think we figured out something like, um, you know, if you look at the population of Western Mass, it's Hamden, Hampshire, Franklin and Berkshire County, we are 14% of the population in the state of Massachusetts. So we should also be getting an equal amount of right. infrastructure money. So that's what we're, that's mm -hmm. the plan. Uh, good. And we'll be discussing that at CCI so meeting. Keep it simple, right? <laughs> certainly 
you know, welcome to join us. I mean, that's an open meeting like everything else, but um, we are just going to keep pushing until we get money. There you go. Good. Okay. That's 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 my report. So um, the mail, we had quite a bit of, of mail. Um, we have had the request for updates from Ember Gardens. Um, the, the update for that is that basically to begin with, the host agreement still is being processed by the state. And so until the host agreement is processed and finalized by the state, then they cannot start any construction and have any reports back to us. So, um, but um, we are on their radar for a, a monthly report once that happens. In the course of uh, sort of discussing about our reports, one of the things that's come to light is that if you think back to when um, Ember Gardens came to the planning board uh, to transfer the permit from Sun's Mass to us, um, unfortunately, that decision was never written up um, or signed by um, the any parties that need to sign that. Um, there's a question as to whether or not since that happened quite a while ago and now they're in the process of the host agreement, is it sort of moot or, you know, what do we do with this sort of hanging legal thing that never happened? Um, Casey, I guess, is checking on that. Um, Jennifer, you were feeling that since it's already happened, I mean, it's already happening, but yes, do you have, Jen? Well, Casey and I talked about it quite a bit today. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm having a harder time wrapping my head around it, but she says that the HCA um, has more validity or power, so to speak, over anything. So that has to be completed and we will go through the processes of signing and filing the special permit after. Huh. So I couldn't quite, un I don't quite get it, but um that's what she says is the process casey that is and we have to write up the decision to begin with too it, right? it's being, it's it is being written it has been written she has it it's just a matter of waiting for the hca to be complete before HCA she said she has it. community agreement yes hmm. okay well um so that goes back on the pending list um, we did receive today a piece of mail um, from a town resident, and then we do have some other mail from other communities, um, the Deerfield, a Deerfield resident who, from 46B Stillwater, who wants to um, begin some construction of an uh, accessory apartment um, and is requesting either a waiver or a change in the zoning because they want to begin construction soon. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, may I have some suggestions on our response to this? Right. I mean, first of all, isn't that, thank you for contacting us. But um, is that a ZBA? I mean, waivers are in the land of ZBA, not in the waiver. We're not in the waiver business. I think she was. They, I think that what they were probably requesting is that we have a bylaw change. So, I think uh, worded. Uh, that, I think, I think it, the way it came through, it did sound like it was a request for waiver, and that isn't us. It just isn't our bailiwick. But if it came to us, maybe that's what it was more suggesting. This would be very nice if I could do this. Well, it's interesting too because they were noting, as is the case, that we do not essentially don't have an uh, accessory apartment bylaw Separate. for new construction for new accessory apartments. So there's nothing to waive, hmm. really. Right. Oh. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so it really is. I mean, I, I would anticipate that I write them back, thank them for their suggestion, let them know that we're having this work group that on, we're ahead. going to move as quickly as we can, but Not this bad. would need to be approved by <clears throat> the town. And um, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. right, right. Does that seem... Yeah, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Remember what I said there. <clears throat> um, let's see. Otherwise, the uh, few town, uh, everybody, everybody's doing town meetings, and then, man, they've got all these public hearings going on. Greenfield, public hearing um, tomorrow on uh, marijuana establishment setbacks and size. 
um, in medium and high density residential areas. Also proposed moratorium on marijuana cultivation um, pending possible zoning changes. So that's interesting. <clears throat> um, they're also having a public hearing on the 12th um, regarding uh, some frontage for a home, a kennel license, a ground mounted solar array, um, and a change in non-conforming use percentage for um, uh, the, the non-conforming use, they're changing percentages between parking, the office, and retail. <clears throat> Conway is having a public hearing on the 10th, um, a special permit for <laughs> 156 foot monopole wireless facility. Uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to look at that. Antenna. Yeah, right, right, right. Monopole. Um, and also a public hearing on the their floodplain zoning bylaw. We did that a couple of years ago. Probably could look at it again, They're but I don't think so. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Waitley did have a public hearing in April, <clears throat> April 26 on um, marijuana, uh, looking at their definitions and their table of use. And Montague um, had a public hearing also um, on the 27th of April, um, looking at a, um, an accessory apartment on a detached garage, certainly something we're addressing in our work group, and also a um, conversion of a single family home to a two family dwelling. So some of that we're in the thick of also, and some of it we're not. Um, mm -hmm. Our next meeting uh, in two weeks, kind of two and a half weeks, kind of um, less than that, <clears throat> the 19th of May for our um, continued public hearing on the Plainfields Park. Um, and then um, the 6th of, of June, moving forward. Okay. Uh, and I, Andrea Leibson has a parting question. note. Has a question. Well, it has a question on the 19th the public hearing will continue. Will that be early in the agenda? It's going to be the agenda. It's going to be mm -hmm. the agenda. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be on the West Coast, so I have to deal with time mm -hmm. change. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, and yes, so. yes, thank you, okay. yes. And no, I, I think we can devote the whole meeting to that. Okay. Any other comments or questions? All right, and two minutes before nine, may I, I have hope a that we adjourn. <laughs> All right, Rachel Blaine. Done. Done and dusted. Oh, oh yes. Oh, I'm saying. yes. Out. She's just saying. She's staying till yes. tomorrow. Yes. She's gonna swear. She's gonna sleep. Yes. 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 Yes.